I'm Alexa Gilmore, and this is Contagious Hope. I see it as I'm not only working for God and I'm working and I'm fulfilling my role as a Muslim woman, I'm also helping a sister. In November of 2019, a CBC investigation discovered that 620 women and children per day were being turned away from domestic violence shelters across Canada because they were already full. That was before the COVID-19 social distancing requirements forced shelters to decrease intake capacity. That was before the victims were locked down with their perpetrators. That was before the economic downturn, job losses, and COVID anxiety led to a dramatic increase in intimate partner violence and a devastating decrease in the victim's ability to leave safely. Newcomers, refugees, women without status are particularly isolated. For those who are Muslim, our next guests are a lifeline. Saima Mafet and Hanan Balbaki work for Nisa Homes, a place where women and children escaping violence can find refuge and new life. Saima, Hanan, welcome. Tell me about Nisa Homes and what makes it so special. Nisa Homes is a uh, group of transitional homes that help women and children that are fleeing domestic violence, homelessness, and poverty. We typically help women and children that are uh, new immigrants, refugees, and non-status clients. Typically, when we get an inquiry, we um, do an intake, um, and when they come come into our homes, um, there's a caseworker that works one-on-one -on -one with them, uh, assesses their needs, and helps them with different aspects of their needs assessment and their goals, whether it's finding a job, um, finding housing, get, getting the financial independence, getting the children back in school, getting schooling or more training done. Um, and essentially when, when a client comes to stay with us, they stay with us for up to three months. And during that time, we help them through these goals. Uh, we try really hard uh, to cater to their uh, language needs and their cultural needs. That work sounds inspiring and, and painful. Why do you do it? Honestly, it's, it's truly an honor um, to work with Muslim women. Um, the reason I personally do it, I see it as I'm not only working for God and I'm working and I'm fulfilling my role as a Muslim woman, I'm also helping a sister, helping a friend. Um, if you see it as that way, it makes the work that we do so much easier. Because if you look at from the outside looking in, it's pretty, it's a lot. It's a lot to do. I'm My mm -hmm. specific role here at Nisa Homes is a caseworker and I'm front line with the women and the children every single day, day in, day out. There's days where you feel like you shouldn't be doing the job that you're doing. But I think when I look at it from that lens, it really allows me to have clarity and give me the strength to keep on going. I would agree with Hanan there. Um, I personally, I'm a huge advocate of giving back to the community and helping the vulnerable populations being a part of their journey um, and, and, you know, help them positively transform their lives. Um, and just like Hanan said, I think more importantly, the work that I do helps me serve God by serving his creation. And it's truly a privilege to uh, work with this population. Yours is a very special set of homes. Why is it important to have a place for women fleeing violence that is openly and proudly Muslim? I think what makes Nisa Homes specifically unique is not only are we serving Muslim women that have a specific way of life that may be different from other faiths, um, but it's just it allows for them to feel more comfortable. It's not only religion at that point, it comes to culture too. And we pinpoint that in our homes, whether it's from small things such as offering different language services. Um, we have Arabic speaking um, women that work here. We also have 
um, Urdu speaking women here and we have a lot of um, different foods that we bring into the home so that they have that that acceptance feeling not only are they having the basic needs but they're having halal food being brought mm. to the home they're being recognized for who they are and they're not being penalized in any way for it um it it really is a homey feeling so many women come here and the second that they arrive they their hearts feel at ease because they're in a muslim home they know that they're not going to be penalized for their faith they know that they can be who they want to be in this in this home here and they can start afresh with alongside other Muslim women and meet women that are not Muslim and learn from them as well so it's it's pretty um, amazing and I just I, I can't stress enough how proud I am to work here hmm. just looking back into the feasibility analysis that we've done in cities before we open our homes what we're finding is that that cultural piece um, is often missing when uh, women that are new um new immigrants refugees or non-status they don't get those needs met when they're going to mainstream shelters whether it's that language uh language need or the language barrier that they face there um in terms of a muslim a woman herself in, in if uh their, their comfort in being able to observe their hijab or their um their prayers or the fasting um and also uh the food itself that uh, hanan mentioned but that cultural piece is huge where you know uh, we try to cater to that cultural needs. We try to provide culturally sensitive services where they uh, feel like they belong, essentially. Mm. And a year ago, I imagine that your culturally sensitive, welcoming spaces, your homes were open to their full capacity. What has changed with the intake process and the living arrangements since COVID-19 came? It's interesting you ask that. Um, initially, when COVID had hit, we'd seen the numbers drop in terms of the calls coming through. Um, and we weren't entirely sure what it was, but when we looked into it more, we, you know, we realized that there's a lot of misinformation being spread um, by perpetrators when it comes to safety and uh, and the fear of the of COVID itself. And so those those numbers dropped initially, but sometime in June it picked up, and since then it hasn't stopped. Uh, we have received at least fifty times uh, fifty percent more calls uh, uh, in the last year than we have ever before. Uh, but at the same time, we've had to you know maintain the physical distancing. We've had to reduce capacity, uh, work in new ways. Uh, we've also had to deal with um, you know safety planning and the safe exit plan. It has been harder to implement those. Uh, we've had to develop remote services because the need has been so great that while we primarily help women and children that are fleeing domestic violence, we also help women and children that are fleeing uh, that that are facing poverty or homelessness, and that population has increased significantly with uh, the increase in job losses and uh, uh, yeah, a, a lack of employment itself. Oh, sorry, it was um, I just to add to Saima, yeah. she said it perfectly. I, I mean the increase with COVID, um, it put us at a shock when we realized that we weren't able to be at full capacity. It, it honestly broke all our hearts that we, we can't help as much as we could in the past. And because of that, it allowed us to even cause more frustration between us co-workers in the workplace, just constantly going back and forth of raising the pros and the cons always on the phone with Alberta Health Services and just checking in to see if there's any way that we can allow for a transitional home like us to have more capacity just because of the women and children that are, are in these circumstances so it it really was more of a um, a moral dilemma for a lot of us and it it really caused a lot of stressors on not only the women and the children that are unable to come into the home, but for the people that are, are trying to do their best and try to get them into the house. You spoke about a 50% increase in the calls coming in over any other year. And I'm wondering, what are you hearing from those women who are in lockdown with their abusers? What are they telling you right now? The first thing that we hear when we pick up those phones and they are constantly ringing is I need to get out. I'm not safe here. 
I don't know, you just need to help me, is a common one, is I just need to get out of here, and instant tears, and you're on the other line trying to figure out what you can do in that moment because you have a wait list and you're trying to safety plan with this woman on the other line who's at her breaking point because it takes a lot of time and courage and to build up that empowerment to actually make the call is a lot. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just to have her be put on a waiting list is heartbreaking. It's, it's tough, but we always are constantly trying to figure out different ways in order to keep these women in safe places. So it's, it's a learning curve for us all. What have you learned about safety planning in COVID times and having to do all that work remotely? So our remote services came into being uh, right in the middle of COVID because we saw the need for it. And as we worked um, through some of the domestic violence cases uh, during COVID, what, what we're hearing is um, the proximity with the perpetrator has increased significantly because now where there are pockets of time when the perpetrator would go to work or do uh, something outdoors with lockdown, they've been in the home constantly and continuously. And so they're never getting that space to kind of breathe. Um, and also the other safe places that they could visit, whether it was a library or, you know, their school um, or going out for a walk, going to the mall, all of those things have had to kind of take a stop because of the lockdown and COVID itself and the fear around it, uh, uh, fear of contracting it. And so that, that proximity in times of, um, uh, in terms of uh, the duration uh, has significantly increased. Um, and that has also added to the safe exit plan where they're not getting an opportunity to leave um, safely um, because the perpetrator is always around. Um, there's always an option of a domestic standby, but a lot of these women and children, they don't feel safe, you know, in, in approaching the police or getting them involved uh, when they need to leave. So we've definitely seen that, that it's harder to get them to leave and come to a safe uh, go to a safe place uh, because the perpetrator is always around. Hanan, I wonder, is there someone that you've worked with over the past year that epitomizes the challenge that so many of our sisters are facing? Um, I'm pretty new on the team. I was taking on a family as my first family on, on my new case list, and she was from another province, and she had four children who were accompanying her she would call at least three to four times a week continuously telling me the same story and we were going to accept her and luckily we did have space for her and it was just safety planning figure out how she's going to move her belongings for her whole life her whole children their covid rates were less scary than they were here in edmonton and that was really frightening for her. Not only was she fearing her life and her children's lives, but she was really scared of this virus and she asked about it constantly. Is it safe for me to come? Is it okay for me to come? And it was a lot of reassuring her and her children that they will be safer here, but to bring her here was the challenge. Mm. And her story was interesting. I'd say the first two weeks that she was here, she wanted to leave. She was frightened mm. that someone would recognize her in this city. She was fearful to ever leave the house. And she was really ready to go and start a new journey in a new place without having her income in her name. Her child tax benefit wasn't coming to her, it was going to her perpetrator. There was a lot of loose ends before we could ever think about housing. And she didn't know how she was going to do it, but she was about to just get up and go. And it took time and a lot of effort from not only myself as her caseworker, but just the team. We really had to show her that this place is going to be her safety net for a while. And in that time, when she finally realized that maybe this is what she what's best for her and her children she she just flew she did her casework she was like a, honestly one of the most remarkable stories that I could ever tell on this podcast is she just 
she went to the ground running and every meeting she got not five things done she'd get ten things done she just checked off all the boxes and she put that in her head that no pandemic no perpetrator nothing was gonna stop her from starting her new life and then her journey was going to be hers and she's going to make it happen and she was just i i could go on and on but she was just so amazing with her spirit and every woman comes here afraid they're coming from a place where their lives were just of themselves but the moment they feel that comfort and that ease it's it's crazy it's just it's i think it's the home itself sometimes that it's just gives them this peace and this energy and state of mind where they can practice their faith they can be who they want to be and they can allow for themselves to grow I really saw that with this client and she's now moved into her own place. She's there with her four children. They're enrolled in schools in a new province and they're taking it by storm. And I'm just so incredibly proud of them. And there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for her now that she has now financially stable. She has all her finances in her name, a bank account in her name, and she's taking it on now. And many women are like her and i the work that we do allows for women to restart their lives and really empower themselves to be who they really want to be i can see how nisa holmes makes such a difference and how much the stories of each woman affect all of you as colleagues and accompaniers it makes me wonder um, what your work colleagues in this field are telling you about things like fear of COVID and fatigue and burnout at this time how is the staff across your homes doing it's it's definitely COVID has been challenging for everybody um, and uh, the unique thing with Nisa Holmes is that while a lot of businesses and services uh, were able to transition to that work from home. Um, we weren't because we we're such an essential service uh, that now needed to operate more than ever because of the increased demand. Um, you know, initially we had to um, stagger our staff times and, and that took a toll on our staff because we really work as a team at Nisa Homes. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you began to feel isolated that you know i'm in this just by myself but we've had to come up with creative ways to feel you know that you belong to a team and and uh, something unique to nisa homes also is that we are a national organization um so we have uh, homes in uh, six seven different cities at this point and so what we started recently is doing our national meetings um where staff from all the homes get together and they just spend an hour a couple of hours you know doing fun games and whatnot virtually uh, but I think that has uh, definitely added to that feeling of belongingness to a team and to a greater cause. As I hear you speak about the increase in demand that you are, are facing and that so many women are calling but can't get a safe place to be, are we failing our sisters? And what needs to happen instead? That's a tricky one to answer, actually. I don't, I don't want to use the word failing, but I do think at times it could feel that we're doing a disservice to them. Hmm. Tell me. I'm, I think it's one of those moments where we could always wish that we had bigger homes so we could have more women and children be in our homes, have more funds. And, and we always say that more money would probably clear a lot of our issues but i think when we're working in this role it might this might apply more money more problems might apply in the sense that mm. i think it allows us our community as a whole to grow stronger in the sense that i don't know i'm pretty sure and it's in calgary as well but i know for sure simon edmonton the donations are they come in they come in big and I could only imagine that if we were getting the money from our government or from other outsources, 
we probably wouldn't get that attention from those donors. We we are honestly building a community that sees the work that we do and highlights the work that we do. And if I could say that we're doing a disservice to the women, it's probably in the sense that we don't have the capacity or the amount of caseworkers to take on. Mm. In terms of the disservice, again, it's probably the fact that COVID really allowed us to learn and to kind of curveball our way of thinking and how we can help these women. It allowed, it opened up, I see the downfalls and the, and the, the highlights of it for sure, but I, it definitely has caused us to learn a lot about our own roles and our own sense of what we should be doing for our sisters. And I think it's, I think it's going to continue this way for a while in terms of the pandemic. So we're going to have to get more creative, but I think our community is really, we just need a round of applause for them because without them, I don't think we would be where we are right now in terms mm-hmm. of donations. So I think all hats to them for sure. It may definitely feel like we're failing the women in our communities, but honestly, I, I don't think any one person has the capacity to, to help everybody. And I think what the focus needs to be on is prevention more than intervention when it comes to domestic violence, um, homelessness and poverty. Um, and spe- specifically speaking about gender-based violence, Anissa Holmes had the privilege to work uh, on a project recently with the federal government, uh, which ties into the National Action Plan to end gender-based violence. And when we did our uh, you know, roundtables and our, our surveys, what we have found is just across the board, regardless of who we spoke to, whether lawyers or community leaders or service providers, what it comes down to is, you know, that awareness within our communities. And I'm, I'm talking from a Muslim, uh, Muslim perspective, an Islamic perspective where uh, violence, dom- domestic violence is uh, considered very taboo and we, we tend to brush it under the rug. But really, we need to start having these conversations more within our communities um, so that we can learn to prevent it instead of, you know, having to intervene when it has gotten to a point where point of no return, essentially. Um, and that needs to start at the very at, at the basic community level with, within our own mosques and churches, um, you know. Um, and I also think that we need to start at a younger age when it comes to educating our, our youth, um, you know, about healthy relationships and gender roles and um, education at a, at, a, at a school age. Um, yeah, that's where I think things need to change when it comes to these. And that's a lot to, to take in and to think about um, the role of education in and prevention um, so that we don't have this pressure at the front lines. As providers of care on the front lines, where are you finding salam, peace and hope these days? It's been a roller coaster of a year emotionally, I think for everybody. Um, And I I was on the front lines until the end of December. And, you know, every day is a new challenge. Every day uh, there were new issues to tackle. Um, But, you know, seeing the small wins uh, when helping these women and children, uh, you know, the small um, achievements, those really is what I lean back on um, when I'm having a really tough time and through, especially through this past year is, you know, these women, they are so strong and so resilient and the children are so resilient and, and, and they have it in them to, you know, g- come past what they've been through and carve a new path for themselves. Um, and seeing those small wins on a daily basis um, is what keeps me going, to be honest with you. The other day, I, it was it was about minus 40 last week in Edmonton. And um, a woman learned how to take the bus. I, I went on the bus alongside of her. And the whole time I was telling the co-workers of mine, I was saying, I don't know if she's, if she's taking it in. I don't know if she's actually listening to me. I'm not sure. She only speaks Arabic. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if she's understanding. I, I'm worried about that. I, I, I kind of feel like, oh, I kind of wasted a day. Like, oh, I didn't, I didn't get anything out of it. That type of moment. And then, it was so funny because, two days later, she's messaging me saying, I'm going to look at a place and I'm going on the bus on my own. Thank you so much because I learned how to take it. That's what really keeps me going too. Is those little small things that it's like, wow, I, 
we helped her learn how to take the bus and how resilient she is to have learned it in a day and go and take the bus on her own. So I think little things like that are really are, are what's pushing us to go. Uh, Saima Hanan, what is the big win that you are seeking for yourselves, for these women? The big win starts off the moment that they walk through these doors that's the biggest accomplishment of breaking that they're breaking the leash of that cycle of abuse that they've faced for however long they've made that the step in the right direction that's big that's a big win number one big win number two would be the independence that they they get from Nisa Homes and and from within themselves for their their families and for themselves. It's that financial independency. It's that they're going and they're starting their whole life on their own. Um, is that's really the big win, I would say. A lot of these women that we help. They are new immigrants, refugees, um, non-status clients. Um, and when they come to this country, um, you know, there's that cultural shock that there's this loss of um, belongingness. Um, and on top of that, they, you know, face other issues whether it comes to language barrier, um, finding jobs, you know, education, taking care of their kids. And when they go through domestic violence or homelessness or poverty and they come through our doors, what we really want to do, uh, what we really want to help them with as an end goal is for them to be independent, like Hanan said, and self-sufficient um, and really feel integrated into the Canadian culture and society uh, to, to reach that point where they truly believe that they're part of the society and they're able to now give back in their own ways to society as well uh, by being self-sufficient and, and by being in, independent um, um, in their own lives. And what would you want to see from those who are supporters of your work but may not know how to get involved and what to do? The number one thing would be awareness. Um, like Simon was saying previously, um, we don't really know too much on domestic violence and in this realm. It's a taboo in the Muslim community, and I'm sure it's not a taboo. I'm sure it's a taboo, and sorry, in other communities as well. It's it's easy to say that it's only um, taboo in our community because that's what we know and who we know. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm sure it's a, it's a constant thing that it's a learning piece. I would just say to take from all of this is that we all need to learn more. We all need to educate ourselves more. And when you see something that you don't know too much about, specifically on this topic, I think dive into it because the more you know, the more that you can help. And if it's another resource that you have under your under your list, that's plenty. I just want to add to that. Um, if you're a supporter of Nisa Homes or for any other project that's helping, you know, the, the, the domestic violence, uh, people who are fleeing domestic violence, homelessness or poverty, have those conversations within your own families and your own circles and, and raise that awareness, just like Kanan said. Um, it's, it's, you'll be amazed uh, to see that those conversations ripple in its benefits uh, as your generations progress. Right, I think education is so key, and and we can only we can start small within our own families by having these conversations, by learning more about healthy relationships, by uh, implementing those healthy relationships within our own families. Um, and as as uh, if if you're looking into uh, looking for opportunities to help with these homes, uh, feel free to visit our website. Uh, we have smaller ways uh, to help uh, our homes. Uh, we have Amazon wish list set up for all of our homes and uh, your, uh, whatever you're able to do in your own capacity, feel free to do that. Um, we also collect monetary donations. And if you would like to do that, that can also be done on our website. We also have volunteer opportunities. And while that has to be 
that had to be scaled down uh, uh, slightly during COVID. We're hoping in the next few months we're able to come back up and you know start our volunteering activities again, whether it's within the homes or uh, through community outreach or through events um, and other programs in the community. So there's ways to help. Visit our website at www.nisahomes.com. Mm, thank you. And as you look to the future and the possibility of another wave, will you stay working in the homes? I, I think we, we gauge it by what uh, the health services recommend. Mm -hmm. um, will I stay working with the organization? Yes, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. Will we operate in the same capacity? Um, it really depends on what uh, the recommendation is from Alberta Health Services. Uh, it really depends, not Alberta Health Services, but health services in that particular region. Um, and uh, their their quarantine and their isolation, uh, not isolation, but uh, social distancing uh, requirements, et cetera. Yeah, I think taking it day by day and kind of seeing what's going on in terms of our um, province and see, checking on the updates. Uh, every day is a new day, as you guys know, with COVID. Mm -hmm. The rates are fluctuating. They go up, they go down. Hopefully mm -hmm. with the vaccine, that might change. Um, God only knows, but uh, definitely going to continue with the organization. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. And as you think about the women in your care and the children in your care and the colleagues that are at your side. Is there a prayer that comes to mind? What are you holding out hope for and offering as prayer today? I think, well, what I, how I start my day each day before I come into to the home is I start off with Bismillah, Tawakna ala Allah, basically stating that I'm putting all my faith into God and he is the almighty, the all wise and the knower of all things. And I, it's, it's something that puts my heart at ease and allows for me to start off my day in the right way. Uh, don't quote me on the Arabic there, I might have missed a couple of things in my in my translation. Simon <laughs> might be able to <laughs> help me out I, in that I, area. I don't speak Arabic as a first language. Okay. So no. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully uh, that's the gist. Yeah. Simon, what's your prayer for the women that you care for? Um, I probably might tear up as I speak about this. I'm going to try not to. Um, I think personally, um, um, I, I want COVID to be resolved so we can go back to a new normalcy. I, I want to go hug my family um, and my friends and, you know, have that my social needs fulfilled. But for the women in the home, um, I pray that things ease up for them and they come out stronger on the other side of it. I hope that they, they know that they're strong and they have it in them. Uh, to 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 go past it and to come out a new person on the other side and that this is just a phase of life and hopefully it's going to be better on the other side of it. I pray that those women feel the love and support they need. And I pray that you as caregivers feel the same. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, for sharing stories, and for so creatively finding ways to meet the needs of women and children who are so vulnerable at any given time, but who have been made even more vulnerable by COVID and the lockdowns. I have tremendous gratitude for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for uh, having us on here. This podcast, Contagious Hope, explores the way love has spread over the last year. Saima and Hanan have brought the gift of awareness today and call us to action across Canada 
so that one day every woman who calls for help will find it. As we move through the second wave of this pandemic, I hope this podcast has you wondering, how will I boldly, creatively, lovingly answer the call to be at the side of my neighbor? For there is no lockdown on love, no quarantine on God's grace. This is Alexa Gilmore, and I'm sharing these stories as a way of inviting you, the faithful, to the front lines, the back alleys, the migrant fields, the lonely homes, and every place where Christ is found. Keep on loving, my friends, because nothing spreads like hope. Contagious Hope is produced by Rev. Alexa Gilmore with assistance from the McGeechee Senior Scholarship, awarded by the United Church of Canada Foundation. Special thanks to our guests and our editor, Peter Restivo. To share your feedback and join in the conversation, email gilmorealexa at gmail.com. That's G-I-L-M-O-U-R, Alexa, 